Leaving the lakeside city of Lucerne, the next 48 hours would be packed while traveling to two other lakeside cities. We would be taking the Golden Pass train from Lucerne to Interlaken, where we would enjoy bright blue water and a delicious picnic. Then it would be on to Montreux on Lake Geneva, where we would sample some of the finest cheese fondue and tour the beautiful Chateau Chillon. Following a hurried trip to Lausanne, we would catch a boat and crisscross the lake half a dozen times to reach the city of Geneva, where we would dock and take the train to our final destination for night number 15 in Europe. The Golden Pass Line is a train route oriented for tourism in the Swiss Alps. It runs between Lucerne and Montreux and provides a scenic five and a half hour tour of eastern Switzerland. On the first leg of the journey, we enjoyed sitting in the dining car and having a fresh croissant with butter and apricot jelly alongside an espresso. Fellow minimalists will appreciate the travel size glass jelly jar they provided. There are three different companies that operate on the Golden Pass Line. Zentralbahn operates between Lucerne and Interlaken and provides the Lucerne Interlaken Express, which offers air conditioned trains with panoramic windows and the diner car. It takes around an hour and 45 minutes to reach Interlaken from Lucerne. Once in the city that serves as the gateway to the Jungfrau region, we decided though we had about two hours before our next train, there really wasn't enough time to tour Interlaken and instead backtracked to a little place on Lake Brienz of the same name. And yes, the water is really that shade of bluish green, only richer in real life. This little jetty was fairly empty when we arrived, and it was nice to soak in the sunshine and watch various individuals as they paddled on the lake or soared through the sky while paragliding off the nearby mountains. It was just beginning to look like autumn while we were there, and the trees were finally shedding green for yellows and oranges. Shortly thereafter, a tour boat pulled into dock, and suddenly our little jetty was filled with passengers, waiting to board and others disembarking. After the exchange of passengers, the jetty, just as quickly, emptied again, and we took advantage of the opportunity to enjoy a picnic lunch of bread, cheese, fruit, and yogurt with muesli. It was such a lovely afternoon away from the majority of mainstream tourism and simply enjoying good gifts from God. Mountains, fresh water, and yummy food on the outskirts of a little Swiss village. On our return to the train platform, we happened to pass this little busy bird and had to capture some of its antics. It was going to build a nest if that was the last thing it did for the day. Back in Interlaken, we stopped in at the local coop, similar to a Migros market, and wished we had just a little bit more room to taste some of the foods that were available there. The assortment of unusual and tasty looking treats is enough to make you want to try one of everything at these places. We ended up settling for a fresh juice and a slice of some Swiss dessert. Though it was beginning to look like fall, it still felt like summer, as no doubt you can tell from the sunburn and glazed eyes in that last clip. So this treat was refreshing. Curry, banana, or something or other. It was time to board the train for the second part of the journey. This time, we would be traveling on the OLS, a regular train from Interlaken to Zweisman. This second leg is around two hours long and was probably the most beautiful section of the journey. As you exit Interlaken, you travel alongside the Ara River and then beside Lake Thun for almost its entire length before branching off to the west, along a track surrounded by mountains. This is also a lovely region to take in the last of the Swiss villages and farms before reaching more modern parts of the country. Somewhere along the line between Zweisman and Montreux, there's an invisible language line. When you enter the train, it seems everyone is speaking German but on the other side, almost everyone is speaking French. It really was quite the anomaly to us. After a harried walk in Montreux, we settled in at our Airbnb, and then upon our host's recommendation, we visited a traditional Swiss restaurant up the hill and enjoyed the jewel of Swiss dining, cheese fondue. It was a delightful experience, and our surroundings made it that much more authentic. We also ended up having the place almost completely to ourselves after a tour group made their exit.
Morning broke with the moon still setting over Lake Geneva. For breakfast, we had fresh pastries from the local patisserie before scurrying out the door to try to find our way to Chateau Chillon. Once again, there was an unfortunate lack of directions and signage, but at last we found a bus that would take us out to this iconic Swiss castle. Chateau Chillon is a castle that was built in the 12th century. It is built upon a rocky island and served as a strategic location controlling the passage in between Europe's north and south for many years. The castle was first mentioned in writing in 1150 and served as a fort for the Counts of Savoy. Extensions continued to be built onto the castle from the 13th century onwards. Between the 1200s and 1500s, the castle began to be forgotten. But in 1536, the Swiss people, more specifically the Bernese people, began to bring it back to life and to update its defenses upon their conquering Vaux, the area that surrounds the castle. In 1798, the Bernese people left the castle during a revolution and the castle became the property of the canton of Vaux in 1803. In 1816, after Lord Byron visited the fortress, he made it famous through his poem, The Prisoner of Chillon. Ever since then, it has attracted individuals from around the world. It is a fascinating place to explore, and there are so many stories within its walls. From the underground rooms, styled after the Gothic cathedrals of the 13th century, through the courtyards, chambers, halls, weapons rooms, and chapel, all the way up to the defenses that offer a gorgeous view of Lake Geneva, the tour is well worth it. Due to our packed schedule, we could only dedicate two hours to visit here, so we do recommend taking at least three hours to appreciate this iconic castle if you are to visit here. It truly is as if you are traveling into history when you visit here. Though it has changed and expanded over time due to the earthquake of 1584, or for the improvement of its defenses, the castle is still quite old and authentic, especially considering both of those expansions took place a couple hundred years ago. The keep that stands in the center of the fortress was built in the 11th century, and it is still quite whole today. In modern times, the four courtyards are used for events and performances, but when you are strolling through them, it almost seems as if you are stepping into a medieval tale and are merely waiting for the rest of the characters of the story to join you. Because we had a boat to catch that afternoon, we had to make a flying trip back to Montreux, where we obtained the train schedule and some meat pastries from a food festival that was taking place in the streets of the city. Then it was off to Lausanne. A short train trip on a scenic route soon had us disembarking the train at one of the city stations and taking a small detour through a Swiss Aldi for two smoothies. Then we caught another train to Lausanne Uchi where we grabbed lunch and made our way to the dock to await our cruise boat. This excursion was something we had scheduled several months in advance and we were looking forward to an afternoon on the water. It was a perfect way to relax, do some journaling, and take in gorgeous scenery on both sides of this massive body of water. Throughout the course of the next three and a half hours, we crisscrossed from one side to the other, docking in at ports, dropping off and picking up passengers, all the way to the other side where we would dock at Geneva. And the water was sparkling blue the whole way. As we approached Geneva, the Jet Du immediately drew our attention. It was created in 1886 for utilitarian purposes, but quickly became a symbol of the city. Henceforth, it was amplified and relocated to the center of the Lake Harbor. This fountain jets around 132 gallons of water out per second and up to the height of around 459 feet. 
it serves as quite a welcoming show to travelers who are arriving to the city from the lake. As our last day in Switzerland came to a close, our plans took an unexpected turn. Find out more on the next episode documenting our travels in Europe.